and welcome to Museum at Home, a program of the Tampa Bay History Center. I am Ross Lamoureux, a historical interpreter here, and we are in our War Stories Gallery, the area of our museum that focuses on the military history of the Tampa Bay area. This case personifies our local, national, and even international history because they are filled with objects pertaining to D-Day or the Normandy invasion of June 6, 1944. These are items from Sam Gibbons. Captain Gibbons, during the time of the D-Day invasion, who went on to become a major in the U.S. Army, was a staff officer in the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment, part of the 101st Airborne Division. I am dressed as a paratrooper of the 101st Airborne Division from that jump going on the night of June 5th into the morning of June 6th of 1944. There are artifacts that survived a parachute drop from the air to a hard landing under German fire as they approached the Normandy coast. The role of the 101st Airborne Division was to go to the rear areas and secure bridges and small towns so that the army could invade from the water side using landing craft. The 101st Airborne Division, along with the 82nd Airborne Division, was tasked with jumping several thousand men in dark of night under fire to capture these areas. The fascinating objects that are in here, I'm going to demonstrate with some reproduction and other copies of these items to show you the relevance, like this particular knife, it's called a jump knife. This was a switchblade knife that oftentimes had a rounded hook cutter that was used to cut shroud lines for the parachutes. But that jump knife was very important as many men found themselves caught up in trees, having to cut their way out. Many of them carrying large ropes called drop ropes that they could tie off and drop down to. As we go through the case, all the way around the edge of this is a scarf that looks very ornamental, but these were made from actual parachutes that they were scrapped. I'm wearing an example around my neck. Some of them were worn out of fashion, but more often than not, they were used as a kerchief or neckerchief. This was Captain Gibbons' actual, I'm wearing the copy of that, worn in just a, one of the many varieties of ways. One of the objects that's here on this table, but not in the case, was this wrist compass. Very necessary, often carried on the opposite wrist of what you would not be wearing a watch on. Captain Gibbons noted that Many, many of the men of both divisions, the 101st and 82nd, were dropped miles off course. These men were trained prior to the jump and given maps where they worked in detail. They knew exactly the areas that they needed to drop. These areas were called DZs or drop zones. And almost every man in his regiment was dropped miles off course. And the several men who had these wrist compasses were able to help them as the sun came up find the correct spots they needed to go. Many of the paratroopers carried different knives. Some had bayonets for their weapons. Others would carry a different kind of private purchase fighting knife. Many of them worn in the tops of the boots, strapped to belts. Another object, not in the case, but worn by many of the soldiers of the 101st and 82nd, were armbands or patches with an American flag. These were done to recognize friend from foe as these men jumped in often rear areas where troops weren't supposed to be. This was an identification badge often worn on the right shoulder. The 101st was known to wear these as an armband where many of the 82nd troops wore them on the shoulder. And one other item also known to many of the veterans of D-Day was also called a brassard worn also around the shoulder. This was a paint-treated paper that would detect gas. One of the many things that American planners were worried about as they invaded Normandy was the chance to get gassed. There were still many fears left over from World War I, and Army chemists developed a paper that would change color if they were gassed. They found out very early on they really didn't work too well, and they tended to rip. The paratroopers in particular didn't like these, but many of the other regular infantry regiments did. I want to pay particular note to the identification tags or dog tags. We have his original pair right here. This is a reproduction pair on an original chain, but the men were issued two dog tags. Paratroopers very much loved to take theirs and tape them together to not make sound 
to keep them quiet. Next to the tags is perhaps one of the neatest objects that I believe in this. This little brass and tin gadget that does this. A clicker. This was called a cricket and it was actually a popular children's toy of the era, often found in things like Cracker Jacks and toy stores. This was an object issued literally a day before the invasion. They would have a certain code as they approach an area, particularly at night. If you felt the presence of someone but wasn't sure if it was friend or foe, you might do one click and a return answer would be two clicks. If they used any number but what was supposed to be used for the code, then you knew that that was friend or foe. This cricket that's in this case is the exact one again, once again, that Captain Gibbons carried. We have this round badge with the parachute in light blue. It's a variation of the one that I have on my garrison cap. Some of the men at were parachute infantry would have that badge, while others would have the parachute and glider badge. Many men in the 101st wore one or the other. The eagle patch that's in this case, that is also on my left shoulder, denotes that of the 101st Airborne Division. That is their distinctive shoulder insignia for that. We have rank denoting captain and major, the two ranks that he held as a staff officer with the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment insignia in the center. His parachute wings, which are noted by the curved wings with the parachute in the middle, what makes this different than most is it has one bronze star affixed to the middle parachute. That stands for a combat jump made as a paratrooper. The ribbons underneath denote the medals that he received as an officer, and the U.S. insignia were worn as part of the dress uniform that he had. As I said, this case is filled with some small objects that many people don't necessarily see when they come here to the History Center. You have local importance, you have state and national importance, but also international importance. Every year as we approach June 6th, I hope that you'll remember the momentous occasion that the invasion of Normandy was. It was the world's largest combined arms invasion in world history. I thank you very much for your time. This was Museum at Home, a program of the Tampa Bay History Center. Visit us online at tampabayhistorycenter.org.